How are you, Vera? I'm nice to meet you. How are you? Fine, Welcome to the show. And Eric, sir, how Thank are you? you? Michael Barrymore, whose real name is Michael Parker, was a hit sensation on British television in the 80s and 90s. Born on May the 4th, 1952, he began work in the West End Theatre in London, before meeting dancer Cheryl Coughlin in 1974, and the two would end up getting married two years later. Now his wife, Cheryl worked as Michael's manager, and most consider her responsible for his rise to stardom, hosting popular shows like What Do You Do, Kids Say the Funniest Things, Strike It Lucky, as well as some of his own shows named after himself. Michael Barrymore was everywhere. As a kid, the humour started very early, and I, I, I just found it was very powerful. I wasn't the best fighter, so if I needed anybody sorting out, Mickey Jarman did it for me because I made him laugh. <laughs> However, as the saying goes, unfortunately, all things that go up must come down. Uh, but the thing that uh, you've got to watch with comedians and people do it even if they're not comedians a lot of us as human beings what we do is we use humor to cover up what's really going on in our head and you that's where you've got to watch uh people like myself and that and can make oh everything's fine and inside they're feeling like crap you know they don't feel well at all On August the 19th, 1995, Michael Barrymore publicly came out as gay and split up from Cheryl the following year. However, she claimed that this was actually the first she had ever heard of it. Her husband, whose career she had managed for over 20 years, informed the public about his sexual status before her. The couple divorced in 1997, and Cheryl would later go on to publish her own book, which went into detail about their entire marriage, disclosing Michael's severe alcohol and drug addiction. Barrymore would later defend himself, and claims that Cheryl was actually a control freak who wanted to determine his every move, including what clothing he wore, which drove him to alcohol, drugs, and gay affairs. He also claimed that he had previously attempted to seek help for his addictions, and it was Cheryl who prevented it, assuring him that he didn't have a problem at all. I never ever took anything when I worked. I know it probably looked like I did because of the manner of way I worked and being really out, uh, off, off the scale sometimes. Do you think there was always some sort of personality trait that you had that meant it was inevitable that at some point you might become an alcoholic? Yeah, I was so dedicated and so focused on my work, that was my addiction. I used to look at myself and say, well, who am I? Who, who, who are you? And I dealt with it by drinking. Mm. And I remember being on the studio floor at uh, the South Bank there and we were recording one of the shows and I kept obsessing about getting upstairs to my dressing room to finish the show to have a drink then I knew I really was in a bad place. You're starting to create situations where you, it's not normal you know and, and people listening to this now will know some of this you know where you're saying I'll, I'll serve the drinks so that you're in charge of the drinks you know always going not going anywhere for fear that there may not be enough booze there when you get there you know taking four bottles to a party instead of one you know, and, 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 and hiding it, and then slowly starting to hide it. Another thing I used to do was to start a row, so I'd have an excuse. Instead of going, I'm going out for a drink, that's what you'd probably go, uh, I'm going out for a drink. No, but that's normal. Somebody like me would go, I'd start about four o'clock in the afternoon, build the row up, and I'd go storming out the front door going, it's because you keep on at me like this, I can't be here. It's nothing to do with it, it's going to go and have a drink. Just an excuse. Just an excuse to have a drink. The couple would no longer speak directly once their divorce was final. Regardless, Michael Barrymore continued being a household name across Britain in the late 90s and early 2000s, before tragedy struck. Somebody was responsible for my son's murder. On March the 30th, 2001, 49-year-old Michael Barrymore was spending the evening with his boyfriend, 30-year-old drag queen Jonathan Kenny, where they shared a curry, while Michael dove into some wine and some shots of Sambuca before they both decided to head into town. Michael would later claim that he was attempting to cheer himself up, as he had not long gone through the messy divorce and was now caring for his ill mother. I just wanted to cheer myself up. So uh, Jonathan was a mate of mine was with me at the time. I said, we go down there, go to a club? 
I said, all right. So it was just on the spur again, on the spur of the moment. I didn't have any intention to go out to the club that night. They arrived at the Millennium Nightclub in Harlow, Essex at 1 a.m. The place was so busy the bouncer had to help a very drunk Michael Barrymore evade a crowd of fans who wanted autographs. The management and that uh, looked after me straight away and they put a security car with me and a couple uh, keep an eye on me. The club was busy. I had loads of girls coming up to me and I was talking to loads of uh, the blokes coming up and talking to me and I just talked to, well, it didn't seem like hundreds uh, and it, 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 it was getting, you know, quite heavy because it was a lot of, not heavy as in bad, but heavy and as it was getting a lot to deal with. Bit of an event. Yeah, and I thought, oh, maybe it's a bit too much. While at this club, Michael met 31-year-old wholesale butcher Stuart Lubbock, who was out with his brother Kevin. Stuart was a father of two who had recently split up from his wife just a few months earlier and was often described as a fun and sociable man. Barrymore also met 45-year-old dustman Justin Merritt and his 19-year-old sister Kylie. Word quickly spread that the icon Michael Barrymore was having an after party at his two million pound house. And after some more drinking, Michael ended up losing his partner and climbing into a taxi at 2.30. Stuart had left his brother and climbed into the taxi to go back to Michael's place along with Justin and Kylie. Stuart said to me, Michael Barrymore's in the toilets. And I was thinking, what? Michael Barrymore? Anyway, he came out the toilet and so they're all shaking his hand. They're saying, oh, good on you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. You're the best, Michael. I heard this action and he's coming over in this direction. So I get hold of his hand and say, oh, I, oh, I. And I was using his catchphrase and he said, who are you? You know, and I just smiled at him. Stuart was next to me and that's the reason why I did it. This woman comes out from somewhere and she whispers something in Stuart's ear. He went, oh, all right, like that. And he shot off and went down those stairs. And I remember looking at him and thinking, all oh, right, you're off, are you, Stu? She was actually saying to Stuart, Barrymore's inviting people people back. You know, it was unbelievable. The driver claimed that the taxi was actually booked to go to Hoddedston, but once Barrymore and the others climbed in, he asked to instead go to his home in Royden. But he claimed that Michael was the only one who was severely drunk. Michael Barrymore was the only one in the group who was the worst for wear. He had obviously been drinking and he seemed to just want to go to sleep. Michael Barrymore definitely did not know the man who died. I could tell that from the conversation I overheard in the car. Mr. Lubbock said to Mr. Barrymore, You look nothing like you do on the telly. You look a right scruff. Which told me he had only just met him. I think they latched onto him for free drinks. Mr. Barrymore wanted me to pull onto the drive so that he could pay the fare. But the others insisted they were paying and I got the feeling they didn't want me there. When the police called me at 7am the next morning and told me there had been a major incident at Michael Barrymore's home, I thought he had been done over. The taxi driver reported hearing an extremely drunk Michael Barrymore exclaim, I could do with a good fuck right now. The taxi driver who took you home says, and I quote, you were definitely the worst for wear. Would that be a fair description? I was the worst for wear as me or worse for yes. wear out of everybody else? No, you were just worse for wear yourself. It's the first time I'm hearing this. So. Yeah, just worse for wear yourself. You were quite drunk, I think is what he meant, as he took you home. That's probably acceptable. I mean, I was, I was leaning over the back of his seat talking to him. Once they got past the big electric gates and inside the home, Michael opened a massive fridge freezer, allowing everyone to help themselves to even more alcohol. We got home, I went in, I went down, showed him around the place. Not showed him around the place, but, said, you know, there's some music in there in the front room and that, and help yourself to drinks. Um, did you uh, did you serve them drinks? No, I didn't serve them drinks. They helped themselves. You just showed them where the drinks. Yeah, I showed them where the drink. There's a cabinet in the front room, and there's the fridge and the cooler. Were any of the people who you saw in your house, admittedly, you say you didn't know them, but did they appear to be drunk? Mm. Stuart um, had had a drink. They'd all had a drink, and but nothing, nothing, uh, nothing. I would judge as. Uh, so drunk that they, you know, they had to be taken care of. Stuart Lubbock began drinking vodka, though Kylie claimed that she saw Barrymore offer him some cocaine, to which he declined. She also claimed that Michael put cocaine on his own finger and forcibly rubbed it inside Lubbock's mouth. Did you offer cocaine to anybody? No. You didn't? No, not at all. You, I'm sure you'll be aware that mm. there are now effectively two 
descriptions of what happened on that night, and both of them appear to tally. Um, well, what descriptions are that? Well, Justin Merritt, for example, has said that you offered cocaine to all of the people in the kitchen. Yeah. And he says that you dabbed your finger in cocaine and forcibly rubbed it on Stuart Lubbock's gum mm. in that the never kitchen. Took place. It was also reported that at some point in the evening, Lubbock had taken ecstasy against his will also, but Barrymore has always denied these claims as well. So you, you'd only been drinking? Yeah, I've been drinking. I drank uh, Jack Daniels and lemonade at the club. And then we went back to the, um, to the house. Michael admitted that he drank an entire bottle of whiskey that night, as well as some wine. But at some time between 3 and 4 a.m., his boyfriend Jonathan returned home with two girls from the club, Kelly Campbell and Claire Jones, both just 17 years old. Two of Michael's friends who had previously visited the house in the past, 41-year-old butcher James Futers and Simon Shaw also joined them. Futers had known Michael since he was a kid and he was on his way home at the time when he decided to just pop by for a visit. Nine people were now inside the house, but Michael had only ever met three of them. Most of these people had never even met each other before this night. Inside the home were Michael Barrymore, Jonathan Kenny, Justin Merritt, Kylie Merritt, Stuart Lubbock, James Futers, Simon Shaw, Claire Jones, and Kelly Campbell. And this would be a night that none of them would forget. Futers claimed that as soon as he arrived in the house, Barrymore offered him some white powder on his finger, which he declined. Like before, Michael has always denied this, but cocaine would later be found inside the house. Is Justin Merritt lying when he says that that was what you did and he saw you do it? Is he lying? Yes. Yes, he is. He's lying? Yes. Even though on a previous occasion, on a previous occasion, John Kenny recollects you doing exactly that thing, getting cocaine, dabbing it on your finger and rubbing it in your gums. The two don't tie in. Well, they tie um, in as something that you might do. Something I might do, mm. not to another person. It's something that John Kenny saw you do to yourself. Yeah, you're saying that Previously. I did that on an occasion. Yeah, and what I'm saying to you is... It's given... not something I recall ever doing. No, sure, but to be clear... Yeah, I'm clear about what you're saying. Right. Yeah, very clear. You are saying that Justin Merritt is lying. He is lying. Barrymore claims that he decided to show Shaw and Footers his new house extension, while Kenny, Justin Merritt and Stuart were all in the jacuzzi outside next to the pool. Michael claims the last time he saw Lubbock before the tragedy was when he was walking towards the jacuzzi, which is corroborated by those inside it. Justin Merritt claimed that after a while, Stuart Lubbock left the jacuzzi and was splashing around in the swimming pool by himself. He was ducking under the water and diving about, having a good time. He then went into the pool and was dive bombing. After a while, Merritt went upstairs with Jonathan at around 3.30 and they ended up chatting for 20 minutes. Michael entered at one point to change his shorts, but he would return in just five minutes to break the news went down to the, the corner end of the house. Uh, I gave them some shorts, they changed, I changed into a pair of shorts. Walked out to the pool towards the jacuzzi, everybody was back in the house by then. And then I looked down, uh, which is effectively the deep end, and uh, Stuart was there. Did you realise who it was? Um, not immediately, yeah, well, I did, yeah, it was face up, yeah. They were all having drinks. They said, oh, can we go in the jacuzzi? So I said, yeah, I've got to put the lights on, because otherwise you won't see where you're going. And then I went out of there and had a joint, and as we walked out, I looked down, and there's a Stuart uh, floating in the pool. And whether it's floating, like, when you see that, it's, it, you know, it's a very surreal, thing to see. I was in the house and the others went out. They, they said, can I go in the pool? Can I swim in the pool? I said, yeah, but I, it's halfway through it being built. I put the 
drew the uh, top back, we've got a picture of it there, uh, drew the top back, the switch is over there on the left, and that goes back to show the light up from underneath. I went and had a joint with um, James and, I can't remember his name now, it doesn't matter. And then we went back out, he said, oh, do you want to go to the jacuzzi? I said, yeah, okay. Went out, and the other lot had been out earlier. And when we went outside, looked down, and I didn't even know Stuart's name at the time. It, just, just, it was just another member of the party, right? Looked down, and he's there floating in the pool, whether he's down or the, the top or whatever. It's estimated that Stuart was only left alone by the water for around 10 minutes or so when this tragic event took place. At some point, Michael, James Footers and Simon Shaw found the unconscious body of Stuart Lubbock at the bottom of the swimming pool, wearing nothing but his boxer shorts. But upon discovering the body, instead of jumping in, Barrymore rushed off to find his partner, Jonathan Kenny. I just freaked out. I ran back in and got uh, Jonathan. I know was a, a lifesaver. And um, Simon and James jumped in and pulled his body out. The first thing I did when I said it was run back into the house and get help from Jonathan, who I knew had lifeguard uh, experience. They came out and started resuscitating him. He claimed that this was because Kenny had lifeguarding experience and that he himself was unable to swim. A claim disputed by his ex-wife Cheryl and a former bodyguard of his, who confirmed that he was perfectly competent in the water. We were going to have a dip in the pool. It looked like there was something down there. Simon jumped in when we realized there was someone at the bottom. The water was calm and was not bubbling on the surface. The person in there was motionless. And then I heard James say, Simon, jump in. I dived and grabbed hold of the person. He slipped through my hold and I swam back up to take more air and dived again. I grabbed hold of the person and pulled him up and someone grabbed me. Once Barrymore returned with his partner, Jonathan attempted CPR. At one point, Shaw actually believed that he saw Lubbock being sick and was convinced that he was breathing again and was going to be okay. Strangely, Barrymore initially claimed that the body was found at 4am, but this was then changed to somewhere between 4.30 and 4.45, though neighbours reported hearing screams coming from the property much later at 5 o'clock. Did you call the police? No. Why not? But somebody was doing it. Justin Merritt called the police and Barrymore claimed that this was done immediately. However, no emergency call was made from the home until 5.46, an hour after the body was discovered. I was standing on the other side and I was I just just lost it. I just panicked. I didn't know what to do. I was just I couldn't believe what was going on. So what did you think as you looked at it? he'd been under the water a while. From the way he was. But that made you panic? Not panic, when I say panic, I just like I'm freaking out it's, uh, at seeing him under there and it just seemed that the, their efforts to do anything, it wasn't coming round. So what did you do? I didn't do anything at that point. With the emergency services on their way, Claire Jones reported seeing Barrymore during this time casually changing his clothes before going through his drawers to collect a bundle of material. Michael Barrymore then left the property and went to Simon Shaw's home, supposedly to clear his head. He claimed that this was at the suggestion of his personal assistant to avoid any bad press, a decision that has been heavily criticised by the public as an act of guilt. Simon and uh, James had come down to uh, get away. There's nothing you can do um, and, and leave the place because, you know, it's going to be swarming with uh, police and, and press. 
and I just went along with that. You're saying that it was suggested to you that you should get out of the house? Yes. Do you think that was the most responsible behaviour? No. I mean, he is a total stranger who's clearly injured in some way in the pool and you leave the house. Yeah. It's almost tantamount to a criminal offence, isn't it? Like leaving the scene of an accident. Can, it, you, can you see? It's only tantamount to that if you're leaving the scene of the accident, if you caused it. I didn't... I, I don't... I, I didn't think about what I was doing. I didn't think what was right or wrong. They ushered me away. They said, there's nothing you can do. You know, I said, I want to... You know, do something, but they said, you, you know, it'd be a nightmare. And I'd just come out and, and, and I didn't leave without straight away ringing my PA mic and telling him where I was. I wasn't running away from the scene. If I was running away from the scene, the police wouldn't have been out to find me straight away. I did not flee the house. I did not flee and suggest I was running away. I phoned Mike Brown, my PA, my personal assistant, and I said, there's been a problem at the house, told him what had happened. It's going to be surrounded by a press. Yes, I should have stayed. Some people might accuse you of running away from your responsibilities. It's your house, yeah. and you've invited people to your party. Do you accept that that's what, that's what it was, that you were entirely irresponsible? I was irresponsible at the time. Just to leave the house? I didn't think. I'm guilty of not thinking. Again? Again, I didn't think. I didn't think. I, I went along with somebody else suggesting what I'd do. What I should have done is stay there and sorted things out. But I was in no state. I was in no state to, 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 to take control. I just couldn't believe what had happened. Do you think you reacted badly to it? And secondly, do you think the press gave you a far more difficult time than you deserved? It was a combination of both. I've mishandled the situation. You know, I'm nobody's trained in how to deal with tragedy. You know, when you consider I've been in people's front rooms all my life making them happy, how do you deal with remorse on a public scale? You know, it's not something... You know, that's where I did get into the I'm in an iron thing and then feel, not feeling my... Should I say this? Shouldn't I say that? Is it right to say this? Instead of just saying it, I can do it now. And then on, what compounded that as well is the outrageous reporting by not all of them, but, but a lot of the media, you know, turning it into something that wasn't uh, quite what it was and to the extreme of it, uh, outrageous uh, headlines and front pages. And it, it, got, it was almost too juicy for the editors to go another route. I should have said no, I don't need to be here. But we can all do should have's after the event. And yes, I should have. I didn't. You invited people to your house. It was your party. And when something terrible is happening in front of your eyes, even though it was suggested to you by other people, you leave your house. That is not responsible behaviour. No, it's not at all. It's totally irresponsible. And I, I have to, I've got to live with that. You do? Yeah. I fucked up. What more do you want? I fucked up. I get it. And you know, died. I'm sorry. Yeah. I couldn't be more sorry. Jones also claimed to have seen Michael's partner, Jonathan, rushing through the house as if he was trying to hide something. Once the paramedics arrived, they initially believed that it was a heart attack. There were no signs of blood inside the swimming pool or on his shorts, seemingly discarding the possibility of foul play. They fought to save the man's life before Stuart Lubbock was tragically pronounced dead at 8.23 a.m. on March the 31st, 2001. How do you think Stuart died? I think he drowned. There are still some people, for whatever reason, that don't believe it. What do you say to them? I have to go around and live my life. If they've got anything to say to me, they can say it to me personally. When I got involved, um, which was about two weeks before the documentary, Michael sent me a huge stack of papers. I've got them sitting in my office. Mm. I've gone through them all. And, I mean, I just cannot see how anyone thinks that this has been anything other than a tragic accident. I think what took place that night uh, was some early bias on behalf of the officers that attended. 
um, just naturally believing this was a drowning and not what we expect to find these days that we think murder first and then work our way back. Weirdly, the police requested the guests to measure the pool's temperature rather than doing it themselves, a decision that has never been explained. Can you say any more about, you say there's some people who arrived at the scene after he died, obviously in addition to the eight who were there initially. Have you got any information about whether they're men, women, how long after, or? And there were, unfortunately, there were some people that were either connected with Michael Barrymore or the address or people in there that were allowed in and out of the scene. We have spoken to them during the course of the investigation. I've reviewed their evidence. Um, so we are looking at those angles to see whether or not we can find out what happens to those items that are now missing. Do you know how many some is? Um, there were, I can give you the exact number at the moment, but there were, were more than one person that went into that scene after we would, if you like, secured that as a crime scene. They believe that finding out the pool's specific temperature could be vital in determining the cause of death, as jumping into a freezing cold swimming pool can in fact trigger a heart attack. But the pool's thermometer, to this day, has never been recovered. The autopsy concluded that Stewart had a high amount of alcohol in his system, three times the drink driving limit. He also contained high levels of cocaine and ecstasy, which would have been enough to have killed him, though the cause of death was never determined. Stewart also suffered severe internal injuries and damage to his rectum, suggesting that he was sexually assaulted. The door handle to the shed at the property was never located, and it's believed that this could have been the weapon of choice. We did put a scene guard on. Unfortunately, um, there were a few people, a number of people that were allowed back in that scene during the early hours of the 31st. We took uh, crime scene photographs quite early on, which showed a couple of particular objects that I'm really interested in to find out where they, where they are now and to recover them. The first was what appeared to be a pool thermometer that was on the side of the jacuzzi. The relevance being that we believe uh, in the early hours there were individuals that went into the jacuzzi, including Stuart, where I believe that's where the, the sexual assault took place uh, and then subsequently obviously he was, he was found in the pool. We also know from officers there that what appeared to be uh, an outhouse handle or, or, or poolside handle was found broken again very close to that jacuzzi. Both those items we have never recovered. But were they photographed at the time? Um, and the, the, the pool thermometer was photographed um, initially by crime scene <coughs> photographers. Um, the handle was not seen in those photographs, but was described by officers that were present near to that scene. The following day, um, we, we conducted a, a crime scene video, um, which, which was quite standard practice. And during that crime scene video, those items were missing. Um, and we also know that from all the items seized in the property, and we searched bins, etc., they've never been recovered. And I'm really, really interested to find out what happened to them. It was concluded that Stewart did not have these injuries before he left the club, but the cause has never been identified. Michael Barrymore claimed that the injuries were caused by a nurse who allegedly inserted a thermometer into Stewart's anus 14 times in order to try to resuscitate him, though pathologist Professor Jack Drain denies that this could have been caused by a thermometer, claiming that the injuries were so severe another object would have had to have been forcibly inserted inside of him. There were also marks on his forehead, which some believe could have been caused by an arm being clamped around his head as he was being sexually assaulted and he could have died from suffocation. Though some do conclude that these marks could have been caused during attempts to resuscitate the man. We know that, um, that Stuart was seriously sexually assaulted, and, I'm, and I mean seriously, to the point where it, it couldn't have been consensual, it wasn't self-inflicted, there was third party involvement. We also know that, he, that we believe he suffered, um, because of some of the forensic assessment that's gone on, some form of um, whether he was, was held or held down during that, that process. What we also know is that yes, he did have uh, controlled substances in his, in his body, and we also know that at some point in that process, uh, there was immersion involved. All those pieces together, say to me in terms of, and, and the last pathologist in 2007, Dr. Carey, said there is a prima facie case to suggest that, that there was third party intervention in his death, and that's where, that's where I sit with this. Stewart's own father, Terry, believed that his son died before entering the pool, and that this was only used as a way to divert investigators. 
However, during the initial investigation, there was no evidence to incriminate any of the eight people at the house that night. They were all questioned, including Barrymore, who refused to answer any question about providing any drugs to Stewart on the night of his death. You were asked directly if you had facilitated him taking drugs and you yeah. declined to answer. What was the truth about that? Well, I, I didn't facilitate him taking drugs, but um, no, I was advised that by, the, by, by my lawyers at the time. You don't have to answer in a, in, in, in a coroner's call. You can just, I said, well, why don't I just say, I, you know, I didn't. But again, with hindsight, do you... I mean, I... I, I you see that that... No, I, 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 yes, I, but I took... I can, you can see lots of things in hindsight. Yeah. Michael had support from close family, friends and fans, but some criticised him for his behaviour and his story often contradicting itself in interviews. Had you taken any drugs that evening or during the day? No, not during the day or that evening. No, the club was busy. I was high and, and it was a good buzz. Did anybody take any drugs? I took some drugs with a, a couple of them. By October, seven months later, Michael Barrymore received a warning for drug offences and for allowing his home to be used for the consumption of drugs, but no charges were pressed and the case of Stuart Lubbock's death remained open. Given the fact that you have been honest enough to admit that you've used cocaine previously mm. and that there are other friends of yours who recollect you buying cocaine and using cocaine, yeah. is it not possible that you had cocaine in the house that evening? It's possible to put coke. I mean, a trace of cocaine was found in the house. Is it not possible that you gave cocaine no, to the guests? No, it isn't possible. I'm why, I'm actually, why, are you, I, why are you so categoric on that? Because I, actually, for that for that evening, I know the sequence of events. I wasn't so off it that I didn't know what was going on. What do you take responsibility for? I was responsible for allowing people to come back to my house and uh, go out to the pool you would assume was capable of looking after themselves. Regardless, ITV cut all ties with Barrymore immediately, severing his two million pound contract as one of their highest paid stars. And the BBC also refused to publish his autobiography. All of the other seven people inside the home gave their details of the events to the police. But afterwards, to this day, for 22 years, they have all never spoken publicly about that night. Have you yourself, Michael, talked to the other people who were there? I've never seen them since that day. I've uh, no, all of them? I wouldn't know if I fell over them. All of them? All of them, none of them. Not one of them got a number, nothing. So you, you don't know any of these people? I don't know any of them. You've never spoken to them? Not one. And one or more of those eight people at that party are responsible for Stuart's death. One or more of those eight people know who's responsible for Stuart's death. I'm equally convinced that those people present at the party must have spoken to friends, family, associates about what happened that night, and I urge them to come forward. However, this incident actually did take place. A friend of Jonathan Kenny claimed, I've been out with John before, and when John's had a drink, he does talk about what happened. He always says the same thing. We all had a really good time, but I have no idea what he means. Has nobody ever tried to approach you who knows any of those people with any information which could be useful? No, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, that there's a bunch of adults partying at your house and somebody dies. And what seems extraordinary to me is that your name's been attached to this for years and years and years. Yeah. Why has nobody tried to contact, or maybe they have, you can let us know, but has anyone ever tried to contact you and said, look, oh, I know one of these people, and they were saying this. It seems like there's been this weird wall of silence from everybody. Well, the wall of silence is because they don't know. They genuinely don't know. Why? And do you believe them? Yes, I do believe Do you believe that nobody at the party knew what happened? I do believe that. I, do, I can't see how, if you, I mean, I've read, I, because of um, uh, going against Essex Police for wrongful arrest, I was allowed to see every single witness statement. And everything I say is not because that's what I want you to hear, because that's the story I want to put out there. It's what's in the witness. I only quoted from facts. I also believe that no one climbed that fence and they, they caused those injuries. So to clarify, you would like a completely independent police investigator. Yes, that's well right. away from the Essex well, police well well away. Well, it's not the local next next borough, yeah. the next area of police. Well away is so completely separate. And, uh
Barrymore maintains to this day that it was a horrific accident and that Stewart simply drowned in his pool. But the drugs found in his system and the injuries he sustained remain a mystery. I had nothing to do with what happened to Stewart. I am innocent. I am not 99.9% .9 innocent. I am 100% innocent. And I am entitled to walk around with my head held high for the rest of my life. None of these witnesses who were party guests for three hours have given to the court an explanation about how Stuart Lubbock, a previously fit 31 year old, should be found floating in a swimming pool at the premises with a significant level of alcohol and drugs in his system and have serious anal injuries. There was no evidence upon which to charge any person either for the death of Stuart Lubbock or the injuries he sustained to his rectum. Michael Parker, me, has an alibi from three people in the period immediately prior to the discovery of Stuart in the pool. I therefore conclude that there is insufficient evidence against all three suspects for there to be proceedings concerning the death of Stuart Lubbock or relating to the injury. However, as no cause of death could be definitively determined, it was officially ruled down as an accidental drowning. Michael and Jonathan broke up not long after the tragic event took place. After seemingly losing his entire livelihood and career, in September 2003, two and a half years since the death, Michael Barrymore attempted a comeback via a one-man show in London. However, after it received negative press and bad reviews, he abandoned it completely after only three nights. I love what I do. Of course I want to be out there. And people say, do you want to get back to the telephone? Of course I do. I used to, when I used to answer that question, I used to go, well, you know, if it comes along and, and, and I think to myself, why don't you just say, no, I want to be there. I'd love to be there. I mean, I understand how you feel and the passionate way that you defend yourself. But I guess objectively... But if I don't defend myself, no, no, you know, I've got people that go around... I get it. ...making get it. all sorts of allegations. I get it. The truth is, I've always done everything anyone has asked of me, and I've cooperated with everyone. Essex Police's own QC has said that we know that Mr Barrymore has had nothing to do with this and that there is no evidence linking him with the injuries to Mr Lubbock or the pool. I don't love having on the front page, you are a murderer, with no justification, no investigation, and no support, and no evidence. I was being as honest as I can. I've only got the one story. I don't know anything else, otherwise I would have said. I would have said what it is. I've had many years of uh, press and following uh, to that intensity. In, uh, you know, I've been followed all the time by motorbikes, been followed by cars. Uh, outside my house all the time, helicopters over the house taking shots so your garden's given any sanctuary. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. I've been called everything there is, believe me, everything. I have been called everything. So whatever you say, you can't hurt me any more than I've been hurt. I've been bashed against every pillar and post. So giving me a bashing is not going to gain any brownie points anywhere. By December that year, he left the country to live in New Zealand. It's believed that this was due to him receiving a tax bill for £1.4 million. It took time for me to come through to realise, hang about, I mean, I'm not standing for this anymore, it's not fair. You know, I don't see why I should be bashed from pillar to post for something I'm not responsible and I have nothing to do with. And it's just convenient because of my surname always put it in the headline whether it's got nothing directly to do with me and then in the subtext about halfway down you key oh, oh yes of course we know he wasn't responsible and had nothing to do with it well you know people don't read when you're driving past you and see a really strong headline that's really damning you you know that's what goes into people's minds and it's taken a long period to you know i had to deal with me first that's why i went to new zealand i didn't run away you know i was at home in this country staring at brick walls it wasn't healthy, I'd have ended up six foot under, and it was a survival thing. By May 2004, he filed for bankruptcy. Michael Barrymore's life seemed to be over. 
Sadly, on April the 1st, 2005, Michael's ex-wife Cheryl would lose her fight with cancer and passed away at the age of 55, without ever resolving her issues with her ex-husband. I was asked, you know, what, what, do you have any regrets in life? I said, well, I don't go down the road of regrets. You know, my life's my life, it's my journey. But I would say not having children uh, 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 is a regret. I would love to have had those, but we couldn't. And not having an amicable divorce, you know, the fact that it got, was so battling in front with, uh, on a public stage. As January the following year rolled around, Michael decided to enter the reality show, Celebrity Big Brother, to try to repair his damaged reputation. Well, at first I said no to it, but I'm, I've got to say, just quite clearly, I, I was glad I did it. Absolutely, you know, it was really intense in there. I, most of the crying at the beginning was me reacting to how fantastic the, the public were for when I went in. Despite being involved in several arguments on the show with his alcohol abuse being commonly mentioned, while some criticised him for his erratic behaviour. George, you're in this frame yeah, of mind because you've been yeah. nominated again. And you, you take didn't... it as a personal slight, yeah. so you thought the most yeah. value is to go for me. No, no. I'm an easy target, no, no. is to go for me uh, because of the target. outside world. Poor you're me, playing the poor outside me, world. poor me, poor me a drink. No, is that what I, you said? Oh, don't no, fucking I told bring you that. that into it. Poor that me, is low. Poor me, poor no. me a drink. You're fucking low. You're out of order. You are out of order. You sit in there with a a face like a sour puss over that side or this side, and a face like a slapped ass over I'm in the corner. I'm trying to avoid confrontation. Shut up. Now you're following me to give me confrontation. is what you want, and you sit up high and beg for it. Oh, really? You beg for it all the no, time. No, I don't. This is exactly what you want. You know what I'm doing? I'm giving you exactly what you want. You are getting exactly what you want, aren't you? No. This is exactly what you want. The what, attention. You, think I want you, you want me all the attention. Like you want all the attention. You think you are don't you? You're getting all the attention now. Look, everybody's seeing all the attention. It's all coming to you now. George, I feel really sorry for you. You're that sad. No wonder Blair threw you out. No wonder you're talking. He performed well, lasting three weeks and even becoming the runner-up, which seemed to open the door for Michael Barrymore to return to the public image. While he was inside the house, Stuart Lubbock's family solicitor applied for Barrymore to be charged with six offences, but this was later dropped, as it was concluded he no longer had a case to answer for. We must have a new postmortem inquest and um, that is that is what I'll be aiming for now. Somebody was responsible for my son's murder. I would like to meet Michael Barrymore. And, and, and it's been written also that, that we haven't met, I've met him three times. I met him uh, a few times. The first time I met him I said, Terry, you know I've had nothing to do with this. He said, yes I do. I think you know, Michael, you know more about this than you said. So somebody keep pointing at me every time we well, When you last saw him, what did he say to you? Because oh, he keeps giving you well, the last time so, it, it was because of the police. He, he said, oh, we need to sort the police out. I said, well, let's do that. Let's get another set of police in. Does he still believe that you know something you're not? We well, seem to, that's what he keeps saying all the time, I've told him. The focus now will be on you, and it is time now for you to either clear your name or put your hands up mm. to what happened, because you must know, I'm absolutely sure, I know you're involved in this. That's so why do you keep having a go at me? When, when, when we part, we keep pointing fingers like, and everybody else is joining in now. And nudge and innuendo. Or, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Oh, well, because ultimately... He needs answers. Ultimately, I mean, he, 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 lost, he, he lost his son. He, because that, it, it doesn't matter how bad it is for me. It's never going to be as bad as it is for Mr. Lover and that family. Never. I know that and I'm aware of that. Why would I, why would I hide or keep anything and put myself through this pain and agony every time that this comes up. He has insisted that he doesn't know, mm. but I'm absolutely sure he knows 100%. Do you please. believe there are people out there that know the answer? Well, I have to, because there's no answer anywhere else. I haven't got a, another story. I've only got the one story that was the same when I was interviewed at the beginning, in 2006, after I come out of Big Brother. We had all this again, and then 
I've got no... Could, if you, I have, could you believe somebody at that party? There were how many were there? No, eight, no, eight, 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 eight people. Nine people. I, I mean, I don't what believe. people say to me, Mike, because they watch live stories and I know you've got great feedback to that. I know you've had the opposite, yeah. obviously, result of a feedback from this documentary. But yeah. what people say to me is, look, there were a bunch of people here, some of which you knew, some you did, who came back to your house. And they're all adults. There's been, obviously, some kind of partying going on. It defies credibility, people say to me, that none of, that nobody had any idea how this guy ends up dead in your pool. Do you share that sense of incredulity? Do you believe somebody knows something? No, I don't believe somebody. Knows. I, well, I can't speak for them, but from what I know, I don't believe anybody could have, could, can't see how it could have happened. By February the next month, the Lubbock family attempted to launch a private prosecution against Barrymore, but this was blocked from happening due to insufficient evidence. Though in April, the police agreed to review the case. On May the 10th, 2006, one of the witnesses, Kylie Merritt, who was now 24 years old, was arrested on suspicion of perjury as she was questioned again and now changed her story. She was given a polygraph test, but suddenly claimed that she was now unsure if her story of Michael forcing cocaine into Lubbock's mouth actually happened or not, though these charges for perjury were later dropped. Interestingly, when Kylie gave this new statement, the polygraph test concluded that she was now telling the truth. On June the 19th, 2006, Michael Heath, who was the pathologist for the autopsy, claimed that certain eyewitness accounts were discredited during the initial investigation, and he believed that the police weren't thorough enough during questioning or when gathering evidence. This led to Stewart's father Terry setting up the Lubbock Trust for further investigation, and on December the 2nd, the case was reopened. I think people that were there, Michael Barron was home, on that day, that night, this thing has not gone away, it won't go away. Even the people that are not directly involved in this must start to feel very, very uneasy. The penny's dropped now. It's time for people now to come forward, whether they're directly involved or indirectly involved. Any bit of information they've got, they must come forward with that. By March, there were still no more answers, but a fresh appeal was launched to try to gain more information as they reached the sixth year anniversary of his death. By May, the Essex police had received 38 separate complaints regarding how they handled this entire investigation. It wasn't until June the 14th, 2007, six and a half years since Stewart's death, when Michael Barrymore, Justin Merritt and Jonathan Kenny were all once again arrested on suspicion of being involved. In a way, I think we should focus now on the other two gentlemen involved. Hmm. Uh, that were arrested with Mark Barham and um, I think it's our time for the focus to go on those two men because I think they've been worried mm. about everything focusing on them and um, I do think if the focus is going to go on to them I do think there's a chance one thing I think they might do, if that does happen, they will throw it straight back to Michael Barrymore. Mm. However, they were all released the next day after being questioned with no further evidence found. By February 2009, some findings of the initial police investigation were published by the IPCC, suggesting that investigators had missed crucial evidence and hadn't correctly carried out vital forensic tests until six years after the death. In March 2010, another fresh appeal was raised for more information, nine years after the fact. By December the following year, Barrymore's luck didn't increase as he was now charged for possessing cocaine and was fined £780. 
And for 10 years, I've gone around and allowed these people to push and push and push. And in our last two years, well, do you know what? I've had enough. I've had enough of being bullied and pushed around. The only reason I've got through the last 19 years, coming up 20 years, is the support from massive support out there from, uh, from fans and my close mates. Mm. And, and my fans and my mates have had this relationship for years. They grew up with me and they know me and they know I'm not a runner, right? And they, through their support, not the, all, all the ones from Twitter Street, you know, who, who, who come up with what, whatever, you know, the pound shop detectives who take a bit of this and a bit of that, and, oh, let's, let's, it's, a, it's a celeb, let's give him another kick it. And how many times am I supposed to be kicked? How many times am I supposed to take it? And I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm not looking, I've, I've been through it. I'm a big boy and I've got every right. I'm gonna hold my head up and walk out on the street high because I am entitled to it and it's my right to. I don't need sympathy. I'm not looking for sympathy. And I'm not looking to change uh, uh, who I am or what I am. I do what I do because that's the only thing I know to do is to normally not be as serious talking as this, to entertain. And I, I dealt with it in, in the way I, I needed to. Um, sometimes I struggled. I did wake up one morning and thought, I don't know, I'll be better off out of this. And I thought to myself, what the hell are you talking about? Just put yourself in the shower, put your clothes on and just put yourself in the day. By July 2015, Michael decided to actually sue the Essex Police Force for his arrest eight years prior. By October the following year, they admitted that the arrest was wrongful and claimed that the arresting officer wasn't fully aware of the grounds for it to begin with. On August the 18th, 2017. The High Court claimed that Barrymore would be entitled to more than nominal damages against the police force, and it was estimated that he would receive around £2.4 million. By December the following year, the court suddenly changed their view and claimed that he would now only be entitled to nominal damages. But on July the 1st, 2019, all claims for the damages were dropped and no payment was given. On February the 4th, 2020. A new documentary was released, bringing the case back to the public eye, with a £20,000 reward being offered for further information, though this was later raised to 40000 In February 2021, after 20 years of fighting for justice for his son, Terry Lubbock was tragically diagnosed with cancer. This led to him now becoming more determined than ever to find the truth before his passing. I do feel that it's getting lighter, but I'm absolutely sure if I consciously reach a cut-off stage, which I want to, I want to do for the sake of my health and the sake of Stuart, because I'm no good. If I, if I, if I go, I'm no good to Stuart. I'm no good. It's a mental thing. If, if, in some ways, I, c I can stop, but in some ways, I wouldn't want to think that I'd let Stuart down. I would appeal from the heart. But there might even be, there might be a, such a small thing, but I would like them to deep Dig deep in their, in their soul and I appeal to them to dig deep and try and remember because it is so, so important to try and ignite this flame that is flickering. This flame has got to get brighter and brighter but we do need a spark we need somebody to come forward. Terry claimed that he would probably die of a broken heart as there still hasn't been any justice and nobody has been charged. In March, he even hinted that some new evidence was going to come to light and we may finally get some answers 20 years later. I can see justice is now starting to appear. I can see it now. I couldn't before, but this day is uh, going, going to be a, the biggest one for me. 
and coincidentally, that same month, on March the 17th, 2021, an unknown 50-year-old man from Cheshire was arrested under suspicion of being involved. Sadly, it wouldn't be in his lifetime, as Terry Lubbock tragically passed away on September the 15th, 2021, at the age of 76, without having ever found out the truth about his son's death two decades earlier. I've given it my best shot. I can hear him now. I've heard Stuart lots and lots of times saying, Dad, you've given it your best shot. You, you couldn't have done any more. So I know, I know that I've done my son proud. I've done the best for him. He was an incredible man. You don't come across many people like Terry Lubbock. His tenacity and determination were incredible. He looked like a mild-mannered man, but he had the heart of a lion. He thought about Stuart every waking hour, seven days a week. He's died sad because he's died knowing people never knew the truth about what happened. But no one could have fought harder for their son. A new inquest was what really mattered to him. He had lost faith in the police. Sadly, he's died not knowing whether there will be another inquest. If you were Terry Lubbock, Michael, Knowing you've read everything about this case, you've read about the injuries that Stuart sustained, um, do you believe, fundamentally, if you were Terry Lubbock, would you think your son had died accidentally? Or would you share his view that there was something more to it, given everything that you've read about this case? If, I was, if, if you were him, if you were the father, it, honestly, based on what is there and the evidence, I would have to go down the line of, uh, of it's, it's not, it's not what they, he thinks. And obviously it's hard to put yourself in any of someone else's shoes, but from what I've seen, it just doesn't add up to that sort of case. Let's stay in touch. Look, I know it's been difficult, and I don't think any of our listeners will, will truly understand <laughs> Terry. That very same month, the unknown suspect was also released without incident due to insufficient evidence. Michael Barrymore refused to comment on the suspect's questioning or identity. That family deserve proper answers, okay? No parent should have to bury their young. My heartfelt sympathies are with the Lubbock family and I truly hope they find peace. And it is for that reason that I've constantly pressed for an independent police force to examine everything to do with the case and reach a proper conclusion. And I should continue to do so. Nine people entered that house, but only eight left alive. Does one of them know what happened that fateful night? And will the rest of the world ever find out the truth? This case has been a mystery for almost 19 years. Uh, and together with Terry, we are absolutely committed to try and find the people responsible for the rape and the death of Stuart Lubbock. Nine people were at that party. We know that not everyone was responsible for what happened, but someone was. Now is the time to come forward if you haven't done so already, to set this matter to rest by providing us with any information you have. You don't need to know there was a murder. You have to suspect there was a murder. If you have a dead body of a healthy person, that is a reason to suspect a murder. With this claimant, he has never given a cogent explanation as to how a young man was so seriously injured in a confined space with so few people present. There were very few people at the property. It was no bigger than a dinner party of nine people not 160. If there had been 160 persons present and 140 had no idea what went on, that might not be very suspicious. But we have eight survivors and at no point not one can offer a single explanation. After he has been found, others were seen trying to help him, giving him CPR. The claimant was seen rummaging through drawers and he is observed carrying something under his arm. His counsel says he was just carrying a jumper. The simple position is the police never discovered, they can't know what he removed. Moved. He left his own home before the police arrived at his home. If you ask the man on the Clapham omnibus if someone at your party died, how many would say they would leave the scene? The claimant bought himself two hours thinking time before he was questioned by the police. A more experienced detective could have lawfully arrested him there
spare him then for leaving the scene. At 5am in the morning of Mr Lubbock's death, Jonathan Kenny called Mike Brown on a mobile and told him what had happened. He said clean up the house and the police were called after this was done. Two people had been paid off by Michael Barrymore to not give evidence against him. It's worth noting that this piece of information was written in an intelligence report as it came from an anonymous tip and has not been confirmed. Stuart will never get his life back, but you will never get the comfort of this being resolved because it's That's hard right. to see how it will be. But I have to live in hope that it, somehow, somewhere, there will be an answer. Yeah. I, I, I hope it's in my in time, whatever's left of my life. Hello guys, this is Rob from Seeking Answers. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. If you do want to see more, please consider donating to Patreon or clicking that join button below to become a channel member. Unfortunately, YouTube's monetization doesn't really cater to the content that we make, so we do need all the help that we can get. Any amount is appreciated and it will go towards keeping this channel alive and making more content, going on location more. You will get perks in exchange and you will help really give this channel the boost it needs. Thank you for all of your support and tune in next week for another video.